Hi, my friends, and welcome to our GED and High Set Math series. I'm so thankful that you're here ready to work on some math problems so that you can pass this portion of your test. Now, before we get started, I want to mention just a couple of quick things. First, I want you to do the problems before me. Pause the video and try to do the problems first. And then it's really more of an active style learning, which is more effective than a passive style of learning, which is just watching me do the problems. Second, stay until the end of the video, okay? I know it's kind of a long video, but you're in this for the long haul, right? We want you to be able to pass the test. So stick with the entire video. Check out the videos that are in my math playlist because they're really going to be effective in helping prep you for this test. And finally, if you're having a lot of difficulties with the problems that are on here, you may need to seek additional help. Either go to your local adult education center or check the link I have in the description box down below for a program that my students really like and that they find effective in helping prepare them for the math test. All right. Let's get started. Welcome to Purely Persistent. I'm Michelle. Okay, let's start with number one. A picture framing shop has the sign shown below in the window. Frame sale, half off 17 inch by 24 inch frames. A customer has a four inch by six inch picture. Sometimes I like to underline those things that I find to be valid, really any number that is in a word problem. If the customer wants to enlarge the photograph so that it will come as close as possible to fitting a sale frame, how many times larger should the photo be? Okay, so really we have two different sets. We have a four by six, right? And we need to have it become close to, not exactly, but a 17 by 24. So what I need to do is I need to figure out how many times bigger is the 17 by 24 to the 4 by 6? And I always like to solve the problem and then look at the answer, okay? So really, I need to take two of the numbers. So the 4 by 17, those guys are buddies. And the 6 and 24, those guys are also buddies. So if I just take 6 and if I divide that into 24, I get 4, right? And same with, same with the four and 17. So four goes into 17 about four times. It's actually 16, but it says, you know, it's not gonna fit exactly, but it's going to be pretty close. So both of those numbers give me four, and that's going to tell me that C is going to be my answer. Number two, consider the advertisement below. Sale, paper sale, $25 per box, 5,000 sheets per box. So which of the following expressions represents the cost in dollars of 20,000 sheets of paper? So notice here, we're not actually trying to figure out how many exactly. We are just trying to figure out what we need to do to set up this problem. So this is actually going to be two steps. So first, we have to figure out how many boxes we need, and then we need to figure out how many boxes times 25, and that would give us our answer. So I have 20,000 sheets of paper and 5,000 sheets per box, right? So if I take the bigger number on top, which is 20,000, and divide that by 5,000, Okay, you want to know that the 20,000 is on top because if the 5,000 was on top of the 20,000, then we would end up with less than a box. And we know that each box has 5,000, so the 20,000 would need to be on top. Okay, and then whatever this is going to equal, we want to times that by however much a box costs, right? And it says right here that one box costs $25. So then we're going to go by 25, okay? And so which of these looks like that? It would be A right here. Just for kicks, let's figure out how much it would cost. So if we take 
20,000 divided by five, we can actually get rid of these three zeros and get rid of these three zeros. If we're doing it by hand, 20 over five is simply just four, right? And then four times 25 is going to be $100. But that's clearly not necessary for this problem, just kind of fun to figure out. But don't actually do that on the test, okay? Get, move on to the next problem, don't, uh, don't figure that out on the test. <laughs> Number three, which of the following sets of data would be rep best represented by a circle graph? Okay, so when we have a circle graph, usually those are going to equal 100, okay? So imagine we have a pie and each person gets a percent of the pie, it equals up to being 100. And so we need to be mindful of this. We are not looking for bar graphs that is sort of comparing, okay? So let's go through this and see which one would best represent a circle graph. So we have the percent. So that's kind of a big, that's kind of a biggie, right? Because percents add up to 100. The percent of recent United States immigrants from different countries. So that would probably look something like this. Maybe we have 50% from one country, 20% from another country, 30% from another country. So that would definitely be well represented on a graph like this. Okay, number B or letter B, the life expectancies of different animals. So that wouldn't necessarily be good because it would be, all right, a giraffe lives to be 30 years whereas an elephant lives to be 70 years. That number doesn't add up to being 100 overall. So B would not be it. College tuition increases over the last five years for a state university. Again, that's not gonna add up to be 100. Maybe they're using percents, maybe this year it increased 1% and last year it increased 6% but it doesn't going to add up to be 100. And if you're going to have a circle graph, it needs to add up to be 100. D, the percents of people living in urban and rural regions in each of the last six years. Okay, so we're talking about percents, right? And you either live in rural or urban areas. And so ur rural and urban would each add up to being 100 but we're talking about the last six years. And so that would probably look better on a bar graph where you can compare the six years since we're not just talking about one year. E, the number of kilowatt hours of electricity used by a household each month over a one year period. So we wanna know the amounts. And so they would probably have a bar graph with 12 months and this is how much electricity was used this month. This is how much was used this, this month, etc. So it would definitely be easier to read if it was on a bar graph. And notice here it also says the number of hours. If it said the percentage, then we could do a circle graph, but not so much. So questions like this, you really just have to go through and analyze each type of question. So the answer here would be A. There's not a lot of math that went into this one. It was definitely a lot more numbering and reasoning that went with this question. Number four, if six bottles of perfect water weigh a total of four kilograms, what is the weight of nine bottles? So essentially we have six bottles, I'm gonna say B, equals four kilograms, right? And we want to know what does nine, nine bottles, okay? So let me ask you, what would, if I took six and I divided that by two, I get three bottles, divide the four by two, and I would get two, bot two kilograms, right? So if I just add these together, that will give me the answer. So two kilograms and four kilograms is going to be six kilograms. And the answer is B. Now guys, this is definitely not the, probably the best way to answer this question. 
I'm not really using a mathematical formula, which I definitely could have used. I simply just used reasoning and I figured out the answer. So you don't always have to use a mathematical formula. Sometimes reasoning works too. Number five, a tourist cab fare was $12.89. If she would like to give the driver a 15% tip, approximately how much money should she give as a tip? Okay, so we basically are just saying 12 89 times 15. And if I use my calculator, I get 1.9335, okay? But I'm not gonna give her that amount of money, right? It's better sometimes to just round, and that's why it says here the word approximately. So here we have this number right here, $1.93, and the number that's closest to that would definitely be $2. Number six, the floor of a 15 foot by 20 foot rectangular room is being covered with carpet tiles. Each carpet tile covers six square feet of floor. Which of the following expressions represents the number of carpet tiles needed to cover the entire floor? So basically what I need to do is I need to figure out how much floor is there? And it says it's a 15 foot by 20 foot. So I have 15 by or times 20. And then I have my carpet squares, right? And each carpet square, it says here covers six feet. So basically I can take this amount here and simply divide that by six and that will give me my answer. So the total amount divided by the number of feet that each carpet tile will have. And so our answer is C. Number seven, which of the following graphs represents the relationship between variables X and Y if a decrease in X is always accompanied by an increase in Y within the domain shown? So that means every time X decreases, then y is going to increase. So basically what we need to do is we just need to sort of take a look at what is going on here. So here, x right here looks like in the first one, number one, x, here it's decreasing. And if you look, y is going up and that means that the y is increasing. So when the y is increasing, the x is going to decrease. So number one is definitely that's happening. Let's look at number two here. So when x goes this way, does y go up? No, no, it looks like y is kind of going down. And number three, when X is going this way, is Y going this way? Well, it is for part of it right here, but then this part right here, the Y is not increasing, it's just remaining constant. And so therefore, number one here is the only one that when X decreases, Y increases. So the answer is A. Now this question here is actually considered to be a hard question, okay? So when you get to questions like this, slow down and really draw the pictures kind of like I did. Each time I drew arrows and that helped me figure out, oh, this one works and this one doesn't. Use whatever tools you need to in order to help you pass the test. A company charges $8 an hour for lawn mowing. What would the company charge for a lawn that is one hour, 45 minutes? So we're $8 an hour, one hour, 45 minutes. So the first thing we need to do is we need to turn one hour and 45 minutes into a number that we can actually work with, okay? So we essentially have one hour and 45 minutes. And 45 minutes, if we take that over 60, we get one hour point 75 
minutes. So 45 divided by 60 equals 75. So that means it's one hour, 75 minutes for this lawn. And then we are going to multiply that number by eight and we are going to get $14. So the answer here is B. Again, make sure that you're proficient with the calculator. This question here was definitely just multiplying, which is fairly straightforward. However, the calculator has a lot of things that can really help you to be successful on the test. So make sure that you know how to use the calculator. Number nine, in a certain apartment building, apartments come with two, three, or four bedrooms. They can have one or two bathrooms and they can be located on the middle, lower, middle, or upper level. How many different types of apartments are possible if any number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and locations can be combined? So this is basically going to be probability, okay? So what we need to do is we need to figure out how many bedroom options are there. So we essentially have one, two, three, right? Two, option two, three, or four, I guess. So that's three bedroom options. And then there can be one, two bathroom options. So two bath. And then we have where it's located. So there's the lower, the middle, and the upper, which is going to be three levels. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to multiply. So three times two is six, six times three is 18. So there are 18 options potentially, and that would make our answer D. Number 10, a restaurant owner is planning to have a courtyard area sodded. The sod comes in rolls that are three feet long by one foot wide. If the courtyard measures 60 feet by 50 feet, which of the following expressions represents the number of rolls needed to sod? So on problems like this, I really like to draw a picture. So we have three feet by one foot. And if I multiply that, I get three. And that's the area. And then I have 60 feet by 50 feet. So I would multiply that and then it would give me, uh, it would give me that answer there, but you can see here, I'm not multiplying. So I can really get rid of D and E because those are both adding, right? So 60 times 50. Now just imagine I have these little tiny blocks of or little areas of sod that are within it, okay? So really I need to take 50 times 60 and then divide that by three because we figured the three out right there and that will tell us how much sod we actually need. So the answer would be B. Consider the following equation. 6x plus seven equals 3x minus five. Which of the following possible first steps would prevent having to deal with fractions when solving the equation. Okay, so here we have our options. Okay, so let's try the first one. So we have six times, sorry, six X plus seven equals three X minus five. So it says combine the six X and the three X. So in order to do that, I would have to subtract three X from both sides. I like to do that so I don't end up with any negatives. And I would have three X plus seven equals negative five. My next step would then be to subtract seven from both sides. And I would have three X, that cancels, equals negative 12 and Simply divide that by three, divide that by three. I'm not doing fractions, I'm just dividing. And I get X equals negative four. I had no fractions at all within here. So that would definitely work. 
So one, yes. Okay, what if I combined the five and the seven first? So without even having to redo this, I could very easily say yes. So I could add, move the five over, and then it would be a very similar sort of setup that would be going on. I wouldn't have to deal with fractions at all. If I have more room on my screen, I could definitely do that. But without even doing it, I know that there's not going to be any fractions that are going to end up. So that one for sure. Okay, dividing both sides of the equation by six. Okay, let's try that. So I have six X plus seven equals three X minus five. So I'm going to divide all of it by six. So uh, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to do each one by six and then I can tell a little bit better. So that would cancel out and there'll be no fraction. But look, here's a fraction right here, seven over six. That's a fraction. This three X over six, that's a fraction, right? It would simplify down to one half X, right? And here's another fraction. So three is definitely not, there are a lot of fractions that are happening. So that would mean my answer here is D. So either one or two would work without creating any fractions. Number 12, a book states that the longest river in a country is about 3,700 kilometers long. The actual length of the river is most likely between, right? So here it's just sort of giving us a, an, an idea, right? So the actual length would, if this is the 3,700, we kind of want that to be in the middle, right? So it would need to be, this would need to be the smaller number, this would need to be the larger number, and then the 37 is sort of in the middle. So if you look at A, it has the 37 as the larger number, so that's not going to be it. B, again, the 3700 is the larger number, so that's not it. Notice here though C, it has a smaller number, 3650, and a number that is larger, 3,750, so that really does put that 3,700 in the middle. D and E both have 3,700 at the bottom end, so those are not it as well, and that puts C as our answer. 13, which of the following correctly expresses X decimeters, Y centimeters, and Z millimeters in terms of meters? Okay, so what we need to do is we need to know the prefixes, okay? What place values these are. Okay, that's something that you're probably going to want to memorize. So I have, this would simply be one, right? That's one. But if I go to the right of the decimal and I put a one right here, this is in the tens place and the tens place is going to be the deci. And if I keep going, now my one is in the hundredths place. That's a th at the end. And that would be the centi. And then the mill would be in the thousandths place, which would be the mill. Okay, so if I change these, from decimal into fraction, it would simply be x over 10, because we need the x to be there. And then we have y over 100, because this is in the hundredths spot. And then the z over 1000, because that is in the thousandths spot. And so if I look at my answers here, the one that looks like this would be A. All the other ones are used incorrectly. So notice here how B and E, they're both using 
fractions. However, they're using the fractions incorrectly. They are the, right here. This one has the X over 1000, and that would be not decimeters, that would be millimeters. So this is definitely not it. And E has all of them using the decimeters, except for the Z, and so that wouldn't work. And C and D are both going the opposite way. Instead of going to the right of the decimal point using the deci, milli, centi, etc., they're going the opposite way using the deca, the kilo, etc. So the answer here is going to be A. 14. A group of hospital workers belonging to the union each earn the same hourly wage. Okay, the same hourly wage. The union dues are 2% of each paycheck, regardless of whether the employee works full-time, half-time, or quarter-time. Does this mean that the amount of money deducted will be the same for all employees? Okay, so let's just do, do a little bit of math, okay? Let's say that each person earns $10 an hour, okay? Just because that's a nice, easy number. So we have the full-time person, which is working 40 hours a week. This is the full. Then we have that times 10, because that's how much their wage is, we said, would be 400, right? Then we have the half-time worker is working 20 times 10 is going to just be equal to 200. And then the quarter worker is working 10 hours. And so they're making $100. Now, if each person pays 10%, 2% in union dues, I would simply multiply that by 0 0.02 and I would get $8 right? 0 0.02 and I would get $4. 0 0.02 and I would get $2. So the question, does this mean that the amount of money deducted will be the same for all employees? No. Look at this. The person that is doing the quarter time is paying only $2, whereas the person that is working full time is paying eight dollars right so let's look through the answers and see which one aligns with what we just figured out so no the quarter time employees will have the greatest amount deducted from their paycheck no we just learned they pay the least c no the half time employee will have the greatest amount no d no the quarter time and half time employees no uh, E, the full-time employees will have the greatest amount deducted from their paychecks. Yes, because in our made-up example, they would have $8. Now, you don't necessarily have to create a made-up problem like I did here, but if you need to and it's helpful for you, then definitely do that, okay? And use easy numbers just like I did here, okay? But if you're can figure this out without having to make up a problem, then don't. An auditorium has a seating capacity of 1,500. For an upcoming community theater play, the tickets cost $4 for adults and $2 for children. At last year's play, twice as many children attended as adults. If the attendance at this year's play has the same ratio, which of the following expressions best represents the best estimate of the total amount of money from ticket sales when the auditorium is filled to capacity? All right, so we have 1,500 seats and we have $4 for the adults and $2 for the children, right? So it says that it filled it. So basically we have twice as many kids as we do adults, okay? So we could simply say that we have one kid, sorry, two kids, excuse me, plus one adult, right? And so we 
could figure that out, if I, if I even just called it x, I could say 2x plus 1x, or simply x, equals 1,500. And if I solve for x, 3x is 1,500, and then x equals 15 divided by 3, which is 500. So now I could figure out, all right, so put this back in, and I have put this into this, and I basically, so two times 500 would mean that I would have 1,000 kids, and the 500 right here for the A, plus 500 adults. So 1,000 kids and 500 adults. How much do the kids' tickets cost? Well, it says it right here, right? Times two, right? So we can put that in parentheses and add it with the adults. And how much do the adult tickets cost? $4. And so basically, 1,000 plus, sorry, 1,000 times two plus 500 times four. And hmm, looks like none of them have it exactly written like that. But look at how E has the 500, time, 500 ti times four and then the plus 1,000 times two. So that would, that would be it, okay? It doesn't matter which one goes in front as long as there's that plus that's in the middle. So E here would be the answer. If a bathroom door is two units tall and one unit would most likely represent, okay, so here we have a bathroom door that's two units tall. So how tall would, would the two units be? So essentially, a bathroom door is maybe like seven feet, right? But this is not using feet. This is using the metric system, okay? And so here, you need to know, kind of like we talked about before, these little prefixes, right? And so knowing that a meter is pretty similar to three feet. So three feet would need to be, if it's two times like three feet tall, that would be about six feet. So meters would definitely, definitely be the answer. Kilo is 1,000, so 1,000 meters. So 1,000 times two, would it really be like 2,000 meters? That's a really tall door, right? Uh, centi? We talked about that in an earlier question. That is one one thousandth of, of a, of a, excuse me, one one hundredth of a centimeter, of a meter. So that's about this big, okay. So is the door like this big? No. Desi is one tenth. So is it going to be like the door like this tall? No. And Millie, oh, it's just a little tiny door, right? So none of those actually make sense. So it's important to understand the metric system and the different prefixes of the metric system and where they go in the number line. 17. The table below shows the average monthly income of people with different levels of education. Okay, so we've got our level of education, high school, vocational, two degree, four degree, and then the average monthly income. After completing her four-year college degree, so she did a four-year college degree, Lynn had a $20,000 loan. She earns the average monthly income for her education. So this is how much she's making, $2,700 a month. If her living expenses are $1,700 per month, in how many months could Lynn pay off her loan? So essentially we have 2,700 minus 1,700 means that Lynn has a surplus of $1,000 per month. So if we take $20,000, because that is how much her loan is, Divide that by $1,000, and 
and I can just get rid of the three zeros there, three zeros there. She could potentially pay it off in 20 over one, which is simply equal to 20. So in 20 months, she could pay off her loan. Number 18 is using the same chart. On average, approximately how much more money will a person who has a two-year college degree earn in an entire year compared to a person who has a vocational degree? So we have a two-year degree is going to be $2,000 minus a vocational degree, which is 1750 So that means $250 per month is how much more, right? How many months are there in a year? 12. So that would mean that they would earn $3,000 more per year. So there we go. The answer is C. Sometimes a little education can pay off, right? Uh, just think about right now, you do not have your high school equivalency certificate. Once you complete it, once you get your GED or high set, hopefully, your wage will go up, right? And in a lifetime, you'll definitely make more money. So I'm just so proud that you're here. 19, the city water department reported that the average amount of water used per household each month in the last year was 1,000 cubic feet. So that was 1,000 cubic feet. So that would be feet cubed per month. Employees from the same department randomly sampled 50 homes, so 50 homes, in the community and reviewed the water bills for a recent month. Which of the following would most likely be true of the water consumption of the 50 households? Okay, so each household would have used exactly 1,000 cubic feet. Guys, it says here average. So when we think about average, that means the middle, right? We add up all the numbers together and then we divide it. So essentially, we have kind of like we did on one of the earlier questions. So this is 1,000. This is the average. Some of them are going to be lower. Some of them are going to be higher, right? So would each house, if it's the average, use exactly 1,000? No, no, it's just the average. So it says each household will have used at least 1,000. Well, in order for it to be the average, it has to be around the middle. Some have to go higher, some have to go lower. So they wouldn't have used at least. And C here says at most. Again, average is usually in the middle. Okay, D, 25 households will have used more than 1,000 cubic feet and 25 households will have used less than 25 cubic feet. So potentially, right? That's usually about how the average goes, but that is not necessarily, but let's take a look at the answer to number for E. 25 of the households will have used exactly, again, it's saying the word exactly, 1,000 cubic feet, and 25 households will have used either more or less. So, no, like, it's, it's just going to be the, the average, okay? So, the answer here would be D, although not necessarily, because sometimes there are outliers. Maybe one house didn't use very much at all and maybe another house used a massive amount which kind of adjusts the average so d is approximately but it isn't i mean it may not actually be accurate but as far as these answers go d is definitely the best answer a family decided to plant a rectangular garden along the entire length of a 20-foot fence in the backyard okay so here we have the fence and here we've got their little garden and it is 25 feet. If the family wants to have a plot of 125 square feet within which to plant, how many feet wide should the garden be? So essentially we're trying to figure out 
this right here. So we'll call that X. And in here, all of that is 125 square feet, okay? So to find the area of a rectangle, we go length times width, oops, I'm sorry, that's an X. <laughs> 25 times X equals 125. So to solve for this, we're going to divide both sides by 25 and that crosses out and divide this by 25 and X is equal to five. So it's 25 feet by five feet. And the answer is A. The efficiency of converting from one form of power to another form is defined by the formula be below. Efficiency equals output power divided by input power. If the efficiency remains constant, which of the following is true? A. When input power remains constant, so input remains constant and output increases. Mm, that's not going to make the efficiency the constant. That would make efficiency go up. So that's not going to be the answer. Okay, when input power increases, output power decreases. Hmm, that's not going to work either. And you can actually use numbers to plug in an equation like this and that will that will definitely help okay so c when input power decreases output power increases so this is just the opposite of what was done in b and that's that's not going to work okay d when input power decreases output power remains constant. So in order for this efficiency to remain constant, they need to do the same thing. So either they both need to go up or they both need to go down. So the answer is E. So let's actually do a little bit of practice so that you can see it visually. Okay, so let's say I'm trying to stick with efficiency equals one. Okay, so um, I'm going to say that my number is going to be two, okay? So this is going to, going to be the base that I start with. So one equals two over two, right? Two over two we know equals one. So let's use this and what we just, what we just read and see if that's going to keep our constant at one. So A, when input power remains constant, so input power, remains at two, output power increases. So let's just bring that to a three. Now, does three over two equal one? No, it doesn't. So again, if you can make up numbers, it helps. So this one here, it has the letter B has the, t the input going up so we'll say that's three and the output goes down. So is one third equal to one? No. Okay, C, it says input power decreases. So two, well, so we'll decrease it. And output out power increases, then that's three over one. Does three over one equal one? No. <laughs> okay, and D is Input power decreases and output power remains constant. So two over one, is that equal to one? No. E, input power increases. So input power increases and output power increases. So three over three, does three over three equal one? Yes. So either sort of looking at it like we did the first time where we were drawing it out and kind of analyzing it like that, that would definitely work, but also using numbers to plug in 
And again, if you're gonna make up numbers, stick with really easy numbers because it'll make it much more efficient. At a track meet, the officials measure the long jumps to the nearest one one hundredth of a meter. If the participant's jump is recorded at 6.50 meters, the actual jump is probably between, okay, just like we did in a couple of the questions before. So 6.50, right? So that's the middle. So we have to have one number below and one number above. Okay, so here, looking at the number lower, we can easily eliminate D and E because those are the exact number, right? And then looking at the number that's higher, we can easily eliminate A and B because it has the number as the higher, right? We wanna do the middle number in, uh, and C has it in the thousandth. The last number is in the thousandth, which is one above the hundredth. And there we go. So C is our answer. Consider the table below. 1,000 bytes equals one kilobyte. 1,000 kilobytes equals one megabyte. 1,000 megabytes equals one gigabyte. Using the approximations in the table, which of the following expressions represents the number of bytes in 2.4 gigabytes. Okay, so I'm going to go 2.4 gigabytes. So here I'm at gigabytes and I need to go all the way over to bytes. So what I'm going to do is I just need to bring it down. Okay, so I have gigabytes. So if I multiply this number by 1000, that will give me megabytes. So I can honestly just move over my decimal and there I go. Now, so I'm at megabytes. So I need to go from megabytes to kilobytes. So I'm going to multiply it by another thousand and that will give me that's the kilobytes. And then multiply it by another thousand and that will give me the bytes. So times it by another thousand equals, I'm gonna have to do it up here. <laughs> okay, that's how many bytes I have. So now I need to use scientific notation to figure it out, okay? If we look at this number, it's really big, okay? And honestly, it's a little bit too big for our brains to comprehend, okay? So what I wanna do is I'm going to put in a decimal point, okay? Notice how all of these decimal points right here, it's 2.4. So I'm going to put my point at 2.4. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to count how many numbers I have to the right of the decimal. So then I can put times 10. So if I had this decimal point right there, how many numbers would I have? So I just need to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so I have A, is to the negative nine and D is to the nine. So what I have to do is I have to know sort of which way it's going, okay? And so it's multiplying it and moving it over that many nines, okay? So the answer would be D. If it was, because this is a really, really large number, if it was a really, really small microscopic number, then it would be to the negative nine. And that would be if we had to, if it was over to the right of the decimal, the, the two, four, if it was to the right of the decimal, 10 digits over, nine digits over, then it would be 
to the negative nine, but because it's to the left of the decimal, that's why it's to the nine, okay? And this question here is one that is considered hard, okay? So hopefully I did an okay job explaining it to you. 24, a new yo-yo factory, ooh, that's kind of exciting, <laughs> is operating at 80% of capacity and produces 4,000 yo-yos daily. When the factory reaches 100% of capacity, how many yo-yos should be produced each day? Okay, so the best way to do this is to use this equation. And this equation is probably gonna be one that you're going to want to memorize. It's not one that's provided on the test, but it's also one that is not told that you need to memorize. But I like to use X over 100 equals part over whole. And now I just fill it in. So I have 80 over 100. And honestly, I could say even uh, instead of X, I could say percent. So I have 80% over 100 equals part. And so at 80%, they are producing 4,000 yo-yos. And uh, I wanna know how many could they do at 100%. So now I'm just going to do a little multiplication. So this is cross multiplying. So 100 times 4,000 equals 80X. And I'm just going to solve for X. So divide both sides by 80 and I end up with 5,000 equals X. So there we go. And you wanna to check to make sure, does this answer actually make sense? So I have 5,000 yo-yos when it's at 100% and 4,000 yo-yos when it's at 80%. Does that number make sense? Yes. If we look at A and B, those numbers are gonna be way too small. And if we look at E, that number is going to be way too big. And so really stop and make sure that the number you're using makes sense. <laughs> Guys, we're halfway there. I want you to give me a thumbs up because you've been watching this video for a long time and you should be proud of yourself. Thumbs up because you made it halfway there. Woohoo! Good job. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, this is really going to help you rock that exam. An artist knows that it costs her an average of $40 per painting to have frames built at a frame shop. She is taking 30 framed paintings to an art fair. If she sells each painting for $100, how many paintings does she need to sell to pay for the frames? So the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out how many frame or how much it's going to cost her to frame all the, all the paintings, right? So she has 30 frames and $40 per painting is how much it costs. So I'm going to go 40 times 30, which is 1,200. So that's how much it costs, right? And if she sells each painting for $100, I can just take 1,200, divide that by 100 and my answer is 12. So essentially she needs to sell 12 paintings to pay for the framing of the 30 paintings. So anything over that, she's making pure profit. So good news is ones that look like number 26 are actually not on the test anymore. They used to be, however, trigonometry is no longer on the GED or high set test. Yes. Computer salespeople at a local store earn a $100 commission per computer for the first five computers they sell each month. For every additional computer they sell during that month, the commission per computer is 1.5 times the rate for the first five. Which of the following is the total commission earned by a salesperson who sells eight computers? Okay, so the first thing we need to do is figure out how much they make for the first five computers, right? So we essentially have 100 
times five, and that equals $500 for the first five. Okay, so I'm gonna put a little five right there. And then the remainder, they make $100 times 1.5, and that is $150 per computer for the ones they sell over the five, right? And it says here that they sold eight computers. So the first five, they make, you know, $100 each. So eight minus five equals three. So they have three more, right? So if I multiply this by three, I get 450 for the last three. So then I have to add the amount they made from the first five, which is 500, plus the amount that they make for the additional three, which is 450, add those together and I get 950. And that is how much the computer salesperson made that month. 28. Suppose the functions f of x and g of x are inverse functions. About what line is the graph of g of x a reflection of the graph of f of x? Okay, so this is definitely another tricky one. I'm going to go over it with you, but honestly, remember, you only have to get about half of the questions correct in order to pass. So if this is going over your head, uh, that's okay because you only have to get half the questions right, okay? So here, what I have is a reflection. So I'm going to make up two graphs that are opposite, okay? So the first one I'm gonna do uh, is just going to be a line that's like that. And that actually represents x squared. And then the other one, what is the opposite? So inverse means essentially the opposite or the mirror, okay, I'm looking for the mirror. And so the opposite of f of x, the other way, so x squared is, you know, essentially like x and two over one. So what is the opposite of two over one? Well, one over two, right? So one over two, x to the one over two is essentially x to the square root of two, okay? And I'm sorry, I, I said I, I did that incorrectly. Is the square root of x, okay? So if I were to do a little graph of that, it would look like that, okay? So the square root of x is like that. So what is the mirrored image that would be E, sorry, D, the answer, the line Y equals X, which goes through right like this. Do you see how X squared and the square root of X, if we had a piece of paper and <laughs> the Y equals X was on the paper and we folded it in half, they would kind of mirror each other, right? So that is the answer, but it's definitely a tricky problem that might be a little bit over over your brain. If you're going to uh, go to college and take some more difficult math classes, you'll be able to go over this and understand it a lot better. All right, number 29. Simplify the following expression completely. So what I'm going to do is simply use FOIL. And FOIL is when we sort of combine, combine together. So here I have the square root of three plus two square root of five. And I'm going, since it has the squared there, I'm going to multiply the entire thing times itself. Okay, so I'm going to use what's called FOIL. So I have to do the first numbers, which is two times sorry, square root of three times square root of three. So the square root of three times the square root of three is the square root of three squared, <laughs> okay? And then I have 
the square root of three times two square root five. So that is going to be two square root of five times the square root of three. And then I do these two right here. So that is going to be two square root of five times the square root of three. And then I'm going to do these two right here. Okay, so plus two, two times two would be two squared, and then the square root of five squared. And now I have to simplify. Okay, so the square root of three squared, so the square root of three is essentially three to the power of one half. And so this, the squaring of that just crosses it out and I have essentially three. Now these two, I can add the two together, which is just going to be equal to four square root of three square root of five plus, so I have two squared, two squared is four times five squared, or excuse me, square root of five squared. That's kind of like our square root of three squared, right? Which would just essentially get that to be five. So I have three plus four, and then the square root of three times the square root of five, I can multiply the numbers that are in the middle and that gives me 15. Okay, so I have square root of 15 because they're multiplying by each other. Plus, and I probably should have done this first following PEMDAS, but four times five is 20. So now I can add these together and I have, just combine my like terms, I have 23 plus four square root of 15. And do any of those match? Yes, D matches. And again, this one is definitely a tricky one. So hopefully going through this helps you. You might consider making up some of your own questions that are kind of like this, which will help you answer them because it was a little tricky. You guys are doing great sticking with me. I know these ones here are pretty challenging. Number 30, what is the solution to this equation? So I'm going to rewrite it out. Okay, so first thing I'll do, combine like terms. So I'm going to add five to both sides. And I have four root seven X minus three equals three. Now to get rid of that four root, what I need to do is I need to simply use just an exponent, okay? So I can get rid of that and go seven X minus three if I take four to the power, three to the power of four. So three to the power of four. So that's three times three times three times three, right? And if I do that, I essentially get 81. So seven X minus three equals 81. This is looking a lot easier, right? So add three to both sides. And I get seven X equals 84. Divide by seven, divide by seven. X is equal to 12. This was another one that is considered hard but we did it, look. E is our answer. 31, what equation represents the relationship that S is directly related to R? So that means when S, when S goes up, R goes up and is inversely related to T. So that means T would go down. So 
basically due to the timing, I'm just going to tell you the answer, which is C. So here, S goes up. So S is going up and R is going up. And if R, if S and R are both going up, in order for S to equal the R, the T needs to go down. Again, if you have the time, if you can make up numbers, simple numbers to put in, it will really help you get the correct answer. Factor the following expression. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is take out the 2x because that's what all the answers have and that's what we're gonna go with, okay? So I have 2x and then I have to take a look at the expression. So here I have 2x cubed and I already took out two of the x's so that means I just have one x left, okay? So uh, x squared minus 10x squared. So I took out 2x, so I'm left with an x and a 5. 5x minus 12x, took out the x, and I took out 2, so that would make it 6. So what I'm going to do here is the same as what I did before using that FOIL technique. However, instead of going, taking the two equations and combining them together, I'm going to take the combined equation and separate it out. Okay, so I essentially am going to have 2x and I'm going to have my two equations here and I have x and x. And so what I have to do is I have to figure out whatever these two numbers are going to be, they need to multiply to be a negative six, okay? So that means I know one is going to be positive and one is going to be negative because it is going to be negative. And I know that when I multiply a negative and a positive, then that's going to give me a negative. So one is going to be positive and the other one is going to be negative. Now, that being said, these two numbers need to add up together to equal 5x, okay? Negative 5x. So, looking at my options, I could have three and two, okay? And you could easily look through this and do process of elimination on each of these options, but um, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to actually solve it and then use the correct answer. So what I'm going to do is since they are multiplying together to equal a negative six, one is positive, one is negative, to add up to five, I know that one needs to be a negative six. Okay, I'm going to subtract the six because negative five and negative six, it needs to be the negative. And then I'm going to go plus one. So negative six plus one ends up being negative five and negative six times one equals six. And so that leaves us here with A as our answer. And if you had time on your test, you could use FOIL and bring it back into that big equation and make sure that it makes sense. Or if you struggled with it like this, you could go through each of the options and see which one foils together to equal the big equation that we have. The 32 questions that we just did were all part of the high set free practice test number two. And the ones that we're going to do further on are going to be a little bit less challenging than the five that we just did. So guys, great job for sticking with those five questions and the 32 previous ones. The next 18 here will go pretty fast. Okay, <laughs> so the number 33, the diagram below shows the different sports students played. So we have baseball, soccer, and golf. So how many students played baseball? So if we look at this, all of the ones that are in this part of the Venn diagram played baseball. And we just count. We have Mary, Fran, Heath, Kathy, Gary, and Dan. So that means six students 
played baseball. See, I told you they were a little easier. <laughs> now, how many played soccer? So this right here represents soccer, and we have Heath, Kathy, Larry, Bill, Gary, Dan, Kelly, and Nick, which is eight. Eight people played soccer. Okay, now it wants to know how many played only golf. So these are the ones that play golf. But if you noticed here, Gary and Dan, they both played golf, basketball, and soccer. And then Kelly and Nick both played golf and soccer. So that means just Ed right here, he's the only one that played golf. So that means just one. Okay, and what is the probability that a student plays all three sports? So what we need to do is we need to look at the options, okay? So we have the option of basketball. We have the option of basketball and soccer. We have the option of basketball, soccer, and golf, right? We have the option of soccer. So that takes care of these three right here. So we have then this one, this one, and this one. So we have the option or this one right here that looks like no one is doing. So we have the option of soccer, just soccer, and soccer and golf. And then we have the option, this one right here, of basketball and golf. And then we have the option of just golf. So what is the probability that a student plays all three sports? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven options. And how many of those options are all three sports? Just one. So there's one out of seven chances. That's the probability that a student will play all three of the sports. Okay, what is the probability that a student plays golf or soccer? So again, we need to take a look and we just said that there are seven options. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven options, right? And the probability that they play soccer or golf, so that would be this and this. So there's really only one, one that doesn't do that. So it's soccer or golf. So that would mean that there are six options. So the probability is six out of seven that they would play soccer or golf. Only one option of where they wouldn't do either, which is if they played just basketball. Okay, what is the probability that a student plays basketball? Okay, so out of seven, right? And here's basketball. And there's one, two, three, four options that they would play basketball. So four out of seven would be the probability that they would play basketball. Okay, now we need to work on a little bit of order of operations. And I actually have a video that relates to order of operations, PEMDAS. So be sure to check it out if you're not familiar with this concept. So PEMDAS, all right, so basically it's, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. And this is going to be just the order of operations. So we need to start with parentheses, exponents, multiplication and division are buddies, and addition and subtraction are buddies. Okay, so the first thing we have here is parentheses. We need to do what is in parentheses right here first. But within the parentheses, we also have to make sure that we follow the order of operations. So we have to take three and then plus the 30 divided by three. 30 divided by three is just going to be 10 times three minus two. So keep going with the parentheses and we have three plus 10 is 13 times three times three minus two. Okay, then we need to do multiplication. So 13 times three is 39 
minus 2, and we simply get 37. Another order of operations, make sure that we have our PEMDAS. Okay, first thing we have to do, notice how it's all in parentheses. Okay, so we don't really need to worry about that. And now we have our exponents. So I'm going to write out the problem. So nine squared is simply nine times nine, which is 81 times four. And now multiplication and division, you can see there's a little bit of both in there. I wanna do from left to right because they're buddies, okay? So here, I have a plus, so I'm not going to do anything with that. And I have 10 divided, 100 divided by 10, which is just 10, and then plus 81 times 4. Again, your calculator is your hero. So that's 324. And now I'm simply just going to add up all of these numbers together, which is 340. Okay, so Start with what is in parentheses and then do the exponents. Okay, so uh, within the parentheses we'll go 2 plus 7 times 7 is 49 plus 60 divided by 6. And looks like all I have left in here is just going to be the division. So I have 2 plus 2 plus 49 plus 60 divided by 6 is 10. And now we can see here that the parentheses actually doesn't matter. We're simply just adding all of the numbers together and it doesn't honestly matter the order. So I'm just going to go 2 plus 2 is 4, 4 plus 49 plus 10 and I get 63 for my answer. 42. Henry mowed his lawn six times total during spring and summer. If he mowed it four times in the summer, how many times did he mow it in the spring? So six times total, and then he mowed it four times in the summer. So six minus four is two times in the spring. Super easy, right? On the high set test and the GED test, you'll definitely have problems that have multiple steps, not just usually simple one step problems like this. The roller coaster in the state fair costs four tickets per ride. If you had 20 tickets, how many times could you ride? So are we going to do multiplication or division? Division, because I have 20 tickets and I'm going to divide that by four, and I can write it five times. Yes, I love roller coasters. 44, Vanessa's dad took her and some friends out to eat for her birthday. If each meal cost $7 and her dad paid for six meals, how many did he pay for? So what are we doing? Multiplication, right? So simply six times seven, which is 42. He spent $42 for Marissa, Vanessa, and her friends for her birthday. Happy birthday, Vanessa. Okay, so now we're going to solve for K. So the first thing I need to do is I need to get rid of this two, right? To get rid of the two, I'm going to multiply both sides by two, and I'm left with K plus 20 equals two. And now simply subtract 20 from both sides and I'm left with K equals negative 18. So here I have a triangle and I need to use Pythagorean theorem to figure out the other side. I have a whole video on Pythagorean theorem if you need a little bit of extra help. But basically it is A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And C is always going to be the hypotenuse, which in this case is the 80 it's usually going to be the right angle right here, the one that is across from the right angle. So A and B, it doesn't matter which one is which, okay? So I have 64 squared plus B squared equals 80 
squared. I'm going to use my calculator and I have 64 squared is 4096 plus b squared equals 80 squared, which is 6400. Now subtract the 4096 from both sides and this cancels out, so I'm left with b squared equals 2,304. And now, using my calculator, I'm going to take the square root of that number, and b equals 48. And one thing you wanna do is check to make sure it makes sense. So the number should be smaller than the 80. Is 48 smaller than 80? Of course it is. So that could definitely be a reasonable number. Number 47 is another Pythagorean theorem, very similar to the one that we just did. So again, we have a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So a squared is 60 squared. Again, it could have been the b squared. That could have been the 60, it, it doesn't matter equals 87 squared. So 60 squared is 3,600 plus the B squared equals 87 squared, which is 7,569. Subtract the 3,600 from each side. And I'm left with B squared equals 3,969. And then I'm going to take the square root of that and b is simply equal to 63. Again, that number is pretty close to the 60 and the way this triangle looks, it should be about similar. So there we go. And another one. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So a squared is 60 squared plus b squared is 80 squared. Look at this, it's a little bit different, equals c squared. So 60 squared is going to be 3,600 plus a squared is equal 6,400 equals c squared. So now I just need to add these two numbers together and I get 10,000 equals c squared take the square root of 10,000 and I get C. Square root of 10,000 is simply equal to 100 equals C. So now I need to figure out what is the area of this figure. And so this is called a composite figure. And so there are two different shapes that are kind of put together. I like to think about this like, let's say it's a plate of brownies, okay? and uh, not using these numbers though, this is kilometers. Those would be a lot of brownies. But if I just cut it, that will help me figure out what it's going to be. So I'm going to cut it right here. Okay, so let's start off with this. So to figure out the area of a rectangle, I just go length times width. So I'm going to take the six times the nine. So I have six times nine is simply equal to 54. And now I have to figure out this one right here, this little dotted one. And I have four times six. So four times six is equal to 24. And now I just have to add these numbers together. So I have eight and seven. So it's 78 kilometers is the area of this figure. Guys, it's our last problem. So let's take it right here. And it doesn't really matter where you cut it. You can cut it anywhere you want. So let's start here. I have four and two. So four times two is equal to eight. And now for this one right here, you have to be really mindful of the numbers that you choose, right? So I'm going to choose six and seven 
However, we also have a five and a 10. And sometimes you actually have to do a little bit of math to figure out what the answers are. But for this one, we actually don't have to. So we're just gonna go six times seven, which is 42. Eight plus 42 is 50. Guys, this was a really long video and you stayed until the end. This is going to help you so much when you take your actual GED or high set test. I am so proud of you for sticking with this entire video. I know it was so long and you guys are so amazing. So thanks for sticking with us and comment below and tell me that you stayed until the end because that is a huge accomplishment. Go practice and go be amazing. Thanks guys, peace.